So in this video, we're going to talk about radial electric fields, and it's important to distinguish between radial and uniform type fields. I'll come to uniform type fields in a later video, but this one's going to focus on radial. So the first thing you need to know is Coulomb's law of charge. So this is like Newton's law of gravitation. It's a law that governs the force between two charges this time. So Coulomb's law states that the force between two charges is directly proportional to the product of their charges, or big Q, little q, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the points. So that must sound awfully familiar, because it's basically saying the same thing as Newton's law of gravitation. And the two sets of fields, gravitational and electric, have lots of very key similarities and a few key differences as well. So... Taking all that text aside and putting it into a useful form, we get this equation here. So we have the force, we have the two charge in the top, and we have r squared on the bottom along with these other terms here. So where does the 4 pi come from? Well, 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. So essentially the flux lines of the electric field are being spread out over a sphere, and the number of flux lines per meter squared or flux lines per area is done by calculating the surface area. So that's where the 4 pi r squared comes from. And then there's this E0 or epsilon 0 which is called the permittivity of free space and it's essentially a measure of how hard it is for an electric flux line or field line to pass through a region of empty space or a vacuum and it's in your formula sheet and it's just a constant for everything. So I mentioned before about point charges, and you can see it underlined a few places. So what is one? Well, a point charge is a charge that occupies zero volume, so it occupies no space. It's only at a single point. And we often model things like protons and electrons, which are the typical charged particles we're going to use, as not occupying any space. They're just a point in space, and it turns out to be a pretty good approximation to make. So that's force. So let's move on to field strength. So field strength, just like it was for gravitation, is the force experienced by a unit charge or a one coulomb charge. And it's the force at a distance r from the point charge. So if we see here, we've got our point charge q, and it's the force experienced by this one coulomb charge up here. Now a couple of convention things. If you're drawing a field around a charge, for instance. So we've got this one here where we've got doing it on a positive. Field lines go from the most positive to the least positive. So you can see here, this plus here is going to be your most positive, so the field lines are directed away from it. And another way word for field lines is flux lines, and you'll hear me use both in my explanation. If we're drawing it for a negative charge here, positive must be, by definition, further away from it if this is negative. So you see your field lines going towards the negative charge there. Now, if you want to show a stronger field, so this negative one, all you have to do is essentially draw more flux lines in the same area, because the field strength is measured by the number of flux lines per meter squared. So if you want to show a stronger field, you can do by just drawing more lines, essentially, like this. So that's field strength. So let's move on to an example of force and field strength. So a hydrogen atom has a single electron in orbit around it, and the nucleus for a hydrogen atom contains one proton. That's what makes it hydrogen. So the radius of orbit of the electron is 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, and it wants you to calculate the field strength at this radius. So let's start off, as always, by stating the equation for this. So it's going to be our big charge Q, 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. Okay, so let's substitute in some numbers. So what we've got here is on the top line we've got a charge of our proton, remembering to indicate the positive sign because it's a positive charge. We've got your 4 pi epsilon naught and your distance between the charges squared. And if you put those numbers into a calculator or, or if you're like me, into Excel. One, four, one, zero, nine. Blah, 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 times 10 to the 11, which if we give it the appropriate number of significant figures, we give to 3 sig fig. So that's going to give you 
an answer of 5.14 times 10 to the 11 newtons per coulomb. And that's going to be 236 figs, because that's the smallest number of significant figures in your question. So what if we want to know the force? So if we want to calculate the force on the electron at this radius, we know that the force is given by Coulomb's law, which is this equation like this. And what you'll notice is you can get to that by taking the field strength and multiplying it by the charge. So let's plug those numbers in. So we've got 5.14, and we're using the unrounded version here. And you multiply it by the charge. So that's your minus, because it's an electron, times 10 to the minus 19, which gives you a force, giving it to the appropriate number of significant figures of 0.22 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. And again, we're giving it to three sig figs. And so some quick checks. It's a positive and a negative charge, so you'd expect it to be attractive. So that's where you've got a minus sign in there, which is helpful. And there, so we've got that. That's the force that is binding an electron to a nucleus in a hydrogen atom. So for those of you who find my handwriting utterly illegible, here are the work solutions written out in nice font for you here. So let's move on to look at potential and potential energy. So just as before, we find that potential energy and potential, instead of being an inverse square ratio, are just an inversely proportional ratio. So potential energy just is a product of the two charges, so Q and Q, and it's just got R on the bottom line here of this equation, not R squared anymore. So let's have a look at potential, so the way of comparing different types of fields, and then we'll look at how we use that in some calculations. So we've got the using instead your Q is equal to one coulomb or a unit charge again, just as before. So again, using V as our symbol, we've got the potential is the charge creating the field divided by four pi epsilon naught R. So how do you know if V is going to be positive or negative as for different charges is going to change? So the key thing is potential is always tested using a positive point charge. So that means that the potential created by a positive charge is always going to be a positive number. So it's going to go from zero and it's going to increase. And that's because you would have to do work to push it closer to a positive charge. With a negative test charge, the field, the potential is always going to be negative. And again, because as you move a positive charge closer and closer, you're not actually going to have to do any work to do that. You can get work out of it because it's attracted towards it. So those are the conventions that we use. So let's make some sense of this and put this into an actual application. So what we want to do is work, calculate the work done to move an electron from one radius to another. Now in a hydrogen atom, there's something called the Bohr radius, and it's after Niels Bohr. And this is essentially the average radius of orbit of an electron in a hydrogen atom. And we want to look at how much work we'd have to do to move it from this Bohr radius to a higher energy level. So we're starting to link in with some of the unit one quantum phenomena type stuff. So first of all, work done is a type of energy. So what we're going to do is work out a change in the potential energy. So we're going to do a final minus an initial, which is as always. So if we want to calculate our potential at 2, we're going to do q q over 4 pi epsilon naught r. So let's substitute some numbers into there and see what we get. And we get this, so it's at its new radius, so that will be its final radius. And if we do that as a calculation, we get an answer of 2.84 dot 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 dot. There's, there's more significant figures which I'm not going to write out. Times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So let's have a look, a quick look at some of the terms in here. You often see when you're dealing with atoms that this 
e the magnitude of charge e squared appearing on these. So you've got your, your electron and your proton are q and a q, both have a charge of 1.6, and then this minus is because the electron is negatively charged, so your top line will always end up being negative. So again, let's calculate the initial potential energy. Again, using exactly the same equation, so nothing at all tricky doing this. And then we're going to put those numbers in again, which we've got right here. And if we do those, we end up with a answer of 3, 4, and lots of significant figures after that, times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So quick check, we'd expect if you move further away from the nucleus, you're going to get further towards zero in potential energy. So we'd expect this to be closer to zero than that one, which is it is, so that's always a good check. So let's calculate our work done. So we've got that. We're doing the change, which is going to be so our final four blah blah blah, blah minus minus four point three four blah 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 times ten to the minus eighteen which is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Now, all my other answers I've given in these examples in these videos so far have been to three sig figures. This is the first one I thought I'd chuck in to make sure we're not just using three sig figs and you're actually thinking about it. So in the question, your 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11 and 8.1 times 10 to the minus 11 are given to two sig figs. Therefore, the answer it's appropriate to give to two, two significant figures here. And you'll notice I recognised that earlier on in the question, which is why I only used 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 instead of 1.60, which you would be equally valid for using there. So, if you prefer them in typed out form, which I wouldn't blame you for doing, here is exactly the same thing, but done in nice computer font.